Hi everyone and welcome to the first open portal hour of the season. My name is Leila Bombra and I'm a programme manager for the research forum here at the Gortold. I want to start by saying as always the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for the generous support of our digital initiatives, especially all things Open Courtauld. Tonight then, to celebrate the upcoming reopening of our gallery, we are teaming up with our digitisation team, volunteers and students for this episode, Captured. 20th century British photographer Anthony Kirsting, the most prolific and widely travelled architectural photographer of his generation, will be the subject of the first display in the gallery's new project space and the 1.1 million photographs in the Conway Library, most of which have never been seen by the public, are currently undergoing a major volunteer-led digitization project supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which put these images, including Kirstein's, into the public domain. I am delighted that you have all chosen to join us to preview Kurdistan in the 1940s, examining the materiality of these photographs, their digitization, and gaining an insight into the stories lives and people that only those connected to the project, the land and its subjects can share. Tonight's event is even more special as the tickets for our reopening on the 19th of November have just been released. So we will drop the link to book in the chat as well, as I know you will all be super ex excited and inspired to visit after this hour. Now onto the structure of the event, there will be a range of informal talks and in conversations, and the session will end with a sort of panel discussion that gives you all the opportunity to ask questions to our speakers. So what to do is to pop those in the chat throughout and I will try to ask as many as I can later on. Before we start, I also wanted to flag that we are on at Courtauld Res on all our social media channels if you wanted to get your questions or comments to us that way. We would also love to know where you are zooming in from, so do put that in the chat for us as well. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce my wonderful colleague, who has been my main collaborator for this hour. Um, Tom Bilson is our head of digital media at the Courtauld and is now going to kick off by introducing the digitization project itself and its upcoming exhibition. Tom, thank you again for being here. I will let you take over the Zoom stage if you wanted to unmute and appear. There he is. Okay, I'll hand it over to you. Right. Thanks, Tom. Um, Thanks, Leila. I'll just share my screen. Right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tom. I'm head of digital media at the Courtauld. Um, I'm going to talk about Tony Kirsting specifically to preview the exhibition that opens soon at the Courtauld Gallery. But I'm also going to talk to you about how we got to this point, you know, how we started working with a photographer whose material was just not really known by the, the general public and also run through the period of his life up to 1944 and 1946, in, on which this exhibition focuses. So here we go, Tony Kirsty. Um, we know Tony as a man of many pictures and many words. And the reason why I say that is, but we've got about 130,000 of his prints and negatives here, just behind me in the Conway Library. Um, I say few words because he didn't leave any diaries. The only material that we have are his handwritten ledger books. And it's from those that we reconstruct his traveling and the sites that he went to during his lifetime. And, you know, almost despite, as Leila said, being described as a foremost architectural photographer of, of his generation, almost every publication to which he has submitted images is now no longer in print. So he's at risk of kind of just simply disappearing into the kind of the analog attic, as it were. Uh, Tony died in 2008. And as I said, on his death, all of his photographs came here to the courthold. Um, many images of Tony's were actually commissioned for publication. But there's a very, very large part of his archive, which was never published. And it remained at his house in Dulwich, um, often used for insulation purposes, because he famously didn't have any central heating. Um, and so when we open a box of prints or a box of negatives, we're invariably looking at pictures known only to Tony. And I think that really adds to the excitement and the sense of discovery linked to this project. And I think the importance of his material, not just for architectural history, but for archeology, span for social history, even as a sense of national identity has really still to be discovered and described properly. 
So let's go back to kind of Tony's early life. Tony was born in Wandsworth in 1916. And here is a picture of a box of very early negatives. Um, as a child, he writes about, first of all, buying a box brownie and going on a photographic trip with his dad. They often went to Hampton Court, Hampton Court Palace. They developed the film, and then they made prints in their back garden using sunlight. But very soon after that, he progressed to using a plate camera, which is a relatively bulky piece of equipment. And it's something that he kept using for almost the whole of his professional career. Tony certainly didn't make the transition into becoming a digital photographer. He could well have done that, but he, he chose not to. And although he used flexible film at some points in his career, he keep, kept returning to glass plates. Um, and just to give you an idea of kind of the prodigy that we're talking about, I'll show you a few pictures that Tony took when he was 11 and 12 years old. Um, I think the photo on the left is a very, very mature picture for an 11 year old to take. And I think he's understood exactly how to kind of compose these slightly wilting jar of tulips. On the right, we've got Wandsworth Gasworks, which is a place that he returned to many, many times as a kind of child photographer. It must have been a very exciting place to visit. And we've got what he would call Charing Cross Station, what we now call Embankment. Um, Tony joined Dulwich College in 1930, and there he wasn't what you would call a great academic success. Um, his school reports don't make for glowing reading. But at that point, he came under the, um, the influence of a maths professor who helped him discover and refine and perfect his knowledge of photography. And um, after Dulwich, he didn't go to university. Um, Tony's family are often described as a banking family. In fact, they worked in banks. They weren't the sort of investment banker type. And he took a job in Lloyd's Bank in Sloan Square. And I think many of you will recognize this iconic building. It's Peter Jones department store. And Tony from his desk would take photographs of Peter Jones being built. You can see it sits on the junction of the King's Road and Sloan Street going off towards the right. And he sold these photographs to a newspaper. And that I think was probably, I think many people who are artists or creative people who are listening to this will recognize that as the first point when you can realize that your um, hobby can actually make you money. Later in life, Tony was contacted by the British Council and they commissioned him to take photographs. This is kind of pre-war of that sort of exemplified the British way of life, the British countryside. And he traveled extensively around the South Downs, this is Telscombe Church, um, photographing the kind of typical red phone box picture, the cricket pitch, the village pub. And these photographs were obviously going to be used for propaganda purposes to celebrate the peaceful civil way of British life. Um, but in 1939, he joined the RAF. And uh, shortly afterwards, he was stationed in Cairo, a little picture of Tony here working behind his desk. Ironically, we've just found this box that he's staring at in the photograph, which is rather wonderful. And he worked on reconnaissance photographs that showed troop movements in the desert. And it's this point that the Courtauld and Tony first cross paths. And this man is Tom Bowes. Tom Bowes was a director of the Courtauld during World War II, and he left his post at the Courtauld Firstly, to work for the RAF, he worked in code breaking, and then he became head of the British Council in the Middle East. And how the two people met, we're not sure, but both wrote a letter to Tony Kirsten that effectively got him out of military service and allowed him to travel very freely in the region. And so with alone, and often he worked with this woman who's in the bottom right photograph, who we assume to be a nursing sister from New Zealand, and we don't really know what happened to her. The pair of them traveled to Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, or sort of extensively around Egypt. And this is where this bulk of this very special group of images come from, it's the ones that were taken between 44 and 46. So now we come to the exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery. As Leila said, it opens on the 19th of November. You can book tickets now, I'd urge you to do so. And um, in choosing the material that we put forward this, for this exhibition, obviously we're limited by what he took, but we've been able to um, use images that 
depict the diversity of Kurdistan at that time, the religious diversity. We have photographs of mosques, of synagogues, of Christian churches. And also we've been able to include a number of images of the Azidi community. And they were a very significant group of people that Tony worked with. He photographed them in 1944. And then he made a special visit back in 1946 to photograph their festival of the assembly, which is an annual festival. And we have many, many photographs of that particular event. So he was captivated by these people and wrote afterwards as to how significant this particular part of his life was. Um, one thing I should say about the exhibition is that we've often used copy prints of Kirsting's photographs, um, but the exhibition, it's all original material apart from one particular print that we, that we can't find a, uh, a sort of historic copy for. So these are prints that he often developed himself in the 1940s, and they have a particularly beautiful silvery quality that I think if you actually see them in the show, you'll appreciate, it's very hard to describe. And obviously, at this point, I should say a huge and very big thanks to the Courtauld Gallery and also for the Research Forum for kind of having faith that we had a collection here that was well worth celebrating in this very, very public and very, very exciting way. Um, I'm just going to show you four photographs from the, sh from the show. This is one that he took of the Great Mosque in Mosul. And um, it's a building that really marks the very beginning and the end of the war with ISIS. This is where the caliphate was first um, pronounced publicly from this mosque. And as you probably know, it was one of the buildings that was destroyed by ISIS as they retreated from Mosul with um, Kurdish army and allied forces just meters away. Um, there were lots of very exciting and very, very kind of uh, amusing stories as to why the minaret has this particular um, slant to it. And the, those are covered in the exhibition. This photograph shows the mosque at Nebi Yunus. Um, it's the burial place of the prophet Jonah, and reputedly in the mosque, a whale's tooth was also kept there to kind of substantiate this story. Um, Nebi Yunus was destroyed completely in 2014. Um, it was bombed. And although that was a tragedy, the effect of that has been that archaeologists have been able to make discoveries, to dig, to explore hidden tunnels under the site and discover much more information about this very complex and very historic building that sat on a hill just outside Nineveh. Uh, this creature is a Lamassu, and as you probably have seen, many Lamassu were taken from Iraq and made their way into European buildings, but this one survived. And Coasting photographed it in 1944, three years after it was discovered, and it was unearthed by a very heavy rainfall that he describes on the back of the photograph. Um, sadly, this was also destroyed um, in 2015. And finally, the last image I'm going to show you from the show is one of these groups that he took at Lalish in 1946. It's an Azidi woman. And I think the remarkable thing about this photograph is that it was taken on a glass plate. And for anybody who is unfamiliar with this technology, it requires a lot of time to, to set up a, a shot. There's absolutely nothing spontaneous about it at all. And yet, Kirsten grabs these images that, firstly, they don't show any hesitancy or boredom or uh, reticence, I suppose, on the part of his sitters. And I think there's a real strong sense of direct communication um, in using this very, very bulky equipment. So I think that's testimony to the skill that he had as, as a photographer. And intriguingly, he never returned to portrait photography again. It would have been a very, very, I think it would have been a fantastic portrait photographer, but it never happened. I guess he needed to make money when he returned home after the war and photographing buildings was definitely his thing. I mentioned the fact that Tony is a man of few words and many pictures. Well, these are a few of the words that we have, and this is his handwritten ledger book. This is all we have to go on, and there are five or six of these in the collection of the Conway Library, and these allow us to date, refer to the negative number, and actually record the location of every photograph that he took, and he's very meticulous in the way that he described this, and I think you can see if you can peer in on the left, we've got Mosul followed by al Kosh, by Sheikh Adi, by Hatra, by Mosul again, and it describes in detail, this particular part of his traveling. And I think the, the last thing I really want to say about the exhibition is it's the moving thing about it. It's the third exhibition of Tony's photographs that was ever held. Um, 
The first one here was at the British Institute in Alexandria in 1945. It just lasted for two weeks, and it's described as English cathedrals and the Middle East. Uh, he had another one in his lifetime at Wandsworth Library, and it was just a, a photo kind of pinned on a, on a pinboard type exhibition, certainly nothing formal. So it, it, it's very wonderful that we've been able to hold this exhibition at a major London museum. So I'm going to say a few words about sort of, so how did we get to this point? Um, how is Tony's collection being discovered? How is it being written about? And more importantly, how is it being digitized and put online? Well, the key word here is volunteers. And I'll tell you a little bit about more about the project in which we're actually engaging with volunteers to put the collection online. Um, this is the last group photograph that we took of our volunteers in, in 2019. Uh, and I was going to tell you a little about, about our history. The, the, the story goes back to 2017. And my task was to find a way of digitizing the Conway Library, which sitting behind me in these boxes is a collection of about 1 million images of world architecture and sculpture. And we'd just started the development phase of the project funded by the National Lottery. And the target was to make it available for anyone to use and to do it entirely with volunteers. It's a daunting project, but this seemed like um, at that point, a step too far. We held our very first open day way back in 2017. And literally, we had a, a, a tray with six coffee cups and a packet of biscuits. We didn't know who would come. And over the course of that afternoon and evening, 154 people turned up to show an interest in the project. So we knew at that point that this was actually going to work, that it was going to be a great, great thing. And to give you an idea, to date, I'm not going to run through all of these stats, over a thousand volunteers have taken part in this project and they've donated more than 32,000 hours of their time. And normally, you know, pre-COVID, we'd run two shifts of volunteering a day, 12 to 18 volunteers. Now we're back to kind of safer numbers of 10. And they do every single task that's associated with putting this collection online. So they do the photography, the cataloging, the transcription. And I think quite unusually for a volunteer project, we don't ask for any minimum hours. People can come as little or often as they want. But the thing that really, I think, works well is that we don't ask for any skills. And this was something that I wanted to build into the project right from the very start. I thought, well, the Courtauld is an educational institution. We should be able to teach people everything they know. If we can't do that, you know, we're really failing in our duty. So we will take anybody and train them how to be an excellent museum quality photographer, cataloger, even skills in paper conservation again. And it's a very diverse community of people that we work with. Over a third have never heard of the Cordor before. We exceed all of our NHLF targets for diversity. And we've also run things like corporate volunteering and many, many workplaces for students. Um, COVID hit us hard. Obviously, we had to stop the digitization, but we very quickly switched to doing other activities. And so, for example, our volunteers have researched biographical entries for the photographers whose work appears in the collection, um, over 720 of them. We've created nearly 100 Wikipedia pages for the most significant. So we're kind of flooding Wikipedia with art historians, which is a kind of wonderful thing to do. And we've also provided transcripts of all of our audio transcripts of our blog, and those are available on Spotify. But the most recent and most exciting step was in November 2020, we launched a new project with a platform called Zooniverse. Um, and that's a crowdsourcing project at which we actually ask people to transcribe every bit of written information that they find on the mounts. And since we've going in November, over 8,000 new online volunteers have taken part and they've transcribed the text for over 350,000 photographs. So this is you know, going well over a third of the library. So I've been no doubt that this will finish and that we'll have every single mount all the information transcribed. And the wonderful thing is it's moderated principally by a core group of our own in-house volunteers who, who look after Zooniverse. And, you know, I should pay testimony at that point to the wonderful team that make this possible. We've got Victoria, our digitization assistant on the left, Fran, our volunteer assistant, Caroline in the middle, our volunteer manager, Faye, our digital manager, and on the right, Mark, our conservation assistant. And those are the people who work every day with our volunteers. And a huge thank you to them for making this all possible. The last thing I'm going to say before I pass on to Katrina, who's our next speaker, is my sort of hobby horse. 
and I'm calling it digital materiality. I don't know if this is a thing, but it's something that I talk about on a daily basis, as anyone who's worked with me will probably know to their, um, <laughs> I don't know, their amusement, I think is the best word. Um, we don't scan everything, we photograph everything. And you can see here, a typical photograph as it appears on the computer. Now you can see we're photographing the whole mount here. We're not just cropping into the photo, into the actual prints. And we use a little bit of raking light. So you see the surface texture in the image. You see the edge of the photograph. We don't crop. We keep this black border around the side. And I think the reason for this is something that I feel very keenly. My background is in um, taxonomy and biology, but also I'm a, I'm a trained conservator. And I always despair at the idea that when you look at a digital image online, it's as if Google has just produced this for you. And you're not always aware that you're really looking at a picture of a physical object, something that exists. It has a parallel existence in the physical world. And so we're trying to preserve as much of the phys physical integrity of the objects as we can. And this, I think, is a very good way of doing it. And likewise, this kind of philosophy extends to the containers in which these objects sit. Now, obviously we're transcribing all of these metadata that sits at the bottom of the photographs, but um, I think it's right that if you're looking at a transcription, you also see the source of that transcription. And that's something that runs through every single operation that we do. We always try and show the source of the material. And I think these two folders side by side, which you will see when the collection is published online, tell a kind of rather magical story as well, because you might encounter the folder on the left in a different frame of mind and have a different preconception of the images that you're going to find inside there compared to the folder on the right. You know, they look two different. One's got lots of greasy fingerprints all over it. And I think the process of digitization as a means of cleaning up collections is something that I completely abhor. I think one has to treat these as physical objects. We're not just ripping the image out of the surface and putting it in the digital domain. We're kind of helping them in their transition into a digital existence and make sure, making sure that they take as much of their physical attributes with them. And again, this is a photograph by Tony Kirsting, and this shows a very good reason why you would always want to photograph the back, because it contains information that he put on the print about how the image should be cropped. And also it reinforces the fact that he is also a photographer. We're not just looking at pictures, we're looking at the work of a particular photographer. And similarly here, this rather kind of absurd scene of steeple chase racing. Again, we want to preserve all of these crop marks within the images. It would be very tempting to crop into these and remove them, but I think that's part of the physical history of the object. So there's a kind of line, last slide is really this thing that we've, we've got this kind of emerging manifesto about sort of digital materialism. And our kind of key principles is that we always want to honor the physical form and integrity of the photograph. Um, we photograph photographs, we never scan them. We use lighting to reveal texture and structure and surface. We never ever cropped and eaten anything. You know, we want this to be true to life for the same reason we never retouch. We always describe where our metadata has come from. And if you think, when you look at museums online and you see metadata, where has that come from? Is it human? Is it being transcribed? Is it from AI? There are all sorts of places where metadata might be coming from. So I think we have a responsibility to always describe how the caption that you're reading might have been generated. Um, we show the source of transcriptions. For this project, we don't always photograph backs and blank pages, otherwise we'd have way, way too much data, but it's something that we would aspire to do in a different context. Likewise, we would aspire to weigh and show scale of everything that we could do, but again, we can't do that here. Um, as I said, we record boxes and folders and shelves, and I think the real key point that I've learned, and this is probably from my background as a biologist, is that we don't let basic cataloging hold back publication, and sometimes there are research projects that are also digitized collections and there's so many rabbit holes that you can fall down when you encounter an intriguing image but i think we're looking at what is the absolute minimum that we can do to get through this archive to get it online and then of course it can be catalogued in more detail at a later date and at that point i will finish thank you Thank you, Tom. I know there'll be plenty of questions coming your way very soon, so please do keep putting them in the chat and I will get to them later on. So now I am delighted to welcome Katerina Dominigini. I hope I've said that right. Sorry if I haven't. 
And Katarina is a postgraduate scholar in the humanities, Wolfson College, and was the recipient of a placement in the Conway Library back in June of 2021. And she has been kind enough to come online this evening to reflect on her time at the Conway Library and think beyond the ruins to give new insights into dealing with images of destruction and their restoration. Katarina, welcome to the virtual courtauld and thanks again for joining us. And um, if you wanted to turn your camera on and unmute, I will let you get your slides up and get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila, for this introduction. Um, I'll try to share my screen now. Here we go. Thank you again so much, Leila, and thank you also, Tom, for your presentation and for giving me the opportunity to present today. It is a great honor and a pleasure for me. And um, just as a quick caveat before I start, really, um, this presentation will be essentially a condensed version of an article that I wrote as part of uh, the micro internship program with uh, Kurtul Connects. So if you want to give the full version of the article I read, please feel free to uh, check out the um, Kurtul blog. I've left a link in the first slide. So in this presentation, I shall briefly explore concepts of renation and transformation drawing from the war damage collection in the Conway Library at the Kutold. Known informally as the Ministry of Works Bequest, the collection comprises several hundred photographs taken by soldiers, historians, and architects across Europe towards the end of World War II. One of Martin Conway's chief interests was photography as a record of buildings that might suffer war damage, and the Ministry of Works images continue precisely that tradition taken by Allied troops chiefly from the United States, Britain, and Poland. They record in often shocking detail the destruction of cityscapes as collateral or deliberate acts of annihilation. As we first approach the Ministry of Works collection without context, we might gaze in awe for a moment at the oddly unique shapes that missing bricks and huge cracks conferred onto the architecture captured in a snapshot. Wartime ruins have, in fact, always exerted an inexplicable fascination on the observer. As early as 1953, a civil servant in the War Office, Rose McCauley, published a groundbreaking and controversial study on ruination entitled Pleasure of Ruins. There she argues that, I quote, the human race is and always has been ruin-minded. The literature of all ages has found beauty in the dark and violent forces, physical and spiritual, of which ruin is one symbol, end quote. Starting with the ancient world, her account ends with a two-page coda on the new ruins, where she advances the provocative conjecture that the devastation evident across post-war London and other parts of Britain will one day be looked on with admiration, just like we now admire the ruins of antiquity. While on a very superficial level, Macaulay must be right, I would also like to suggest that we need to go beyond her unidirectional approach. We can't simply self-indulge in the pleasure of fantasizing about what was once there, driven by mere antiquarian frenzy. When looking at these photographs, we must think of what is now there, just like the soldiers and civilians in situ must have imagined what was going to be there once restoration was completed. Exploring abandoned buildings isn't about reveling in their collapse at all, argues Dylan Thuras, author of the foreword to Dan Barash's Ruin and Redemption in Architecture. Ruins rather occupy, as he puts it, a shadowy liminal space between self-destruction and the possibility of rebirth. We can infer from some visual examples how this whole process of imagination, moving in limbo between destruction and rebirth, might have worked for the observers of the time, looking grimly at the ruined buildings around them, and works equally well for us today as we examine such buildings in the photographs. In the following images, René Levavasseur, a French architect charged with the preservation of historical monuments in the department of La Manche, is caught scrutinizing the damage of two churches in Normandy. Here he lists damage to the beautifully sculpted bell of the Church of Saint-Jacques of Montebourg. Confronted by ruins without being intimidated by them, his attentive gaze makes us think that he was already anticipating in his head the steps through which the reconstruction of the tower would be carried out, 
leading us to wonder in turn whether and how this actually took place at all. Here, imagination gives way to historical documentation. Archives of, of Le Monument Historique inform us that reconstruction works were undertaken in 1949 after a deeper and more resistant foundation for the church had been secured. The square floor of the bell tower was completed in February 1950, followed by the stone spire in August of the same year. Finally, in October 1952, the building was returned to worship. In this other image, similarly, Le Vavasor is shown holding a gargoyle knocked loose from the tower of the Cathedral of uh, Carenton before American forces drove the Nazis from the area. There is both intimacy and remoteness in this picture, I would argue. The architect holds the gargoyle firmly with both hands, as if a father with his child, but also keeps it at a distance in order to better scrutinize it. Again, his expression suggests he has full awareness of the exact spot the piece will occupy after reconstruction. This photograph gives out very strong ritual vibes. Le Vavasor almost looks like a priest holding a newborn during some religious service. A new life is brought into the community and exhibited triumphantly before the eyes of its participants. A new life by the same metaphorical token is also given to the cathedral. The gargoyle will be inset back into the tower. As we can see, while these images capture the past destruence, a moment of desolation, devastation, destruction, this is clearly not the whole narrative. As much as the Ministry of Works collection speaks for itself, it also leaves much unsaid. There is a past constraints as well behind these photographs, a hidden story of human efforts and contributions to the process of preservation, rebuilding and revival which successive generations have perpetrated in written documents and oral narratives. I want to conclude with a contrasting pair of case studies that function as a good memento to the importance of implementing strategies for the preservation of cultural heritage in times of conflict. The first is the case of Monte Cassino, where the famous abbey had been reduced to little more than a sand castle by the bombing of May 1944. Succisa Vireshit are the words that can be read on the coat of arms of the Abbey today, literally meaning cut, it grows back. Indeed, despite the difficulties caused by the post-war period, the Abbey of Monte Cassino was brought back to the light through a restoration project carried out from 1948 to 1956 under the direction of engineer Giuseppe Breccia Fratadocchi. 250 workers took part in the project, working side by side with the monks embodying the mantra of their master Benedict buried there, ora et labora. The statues of the benefactors, popes, kings and princes, which had originally occupied the Chiostro dei Benefattori, were placed under a canopy. And in a rather curious turn of events, the statues now looked at these other humble benefactors working with zeal, having no treasures or privileges to bestow by their hands. We can contrast this extraordinary story of successful cooperation and resilience with a less fortunate one, again from Italy. The Church of Santa Maria in Passione on the hill of Castello, Genova, was severely damaged by two aerial bombardments on 22nd of October 1942 and on 4th of September 1944, which almost completely destroyed the frescoes and also caused serious damage to the outer walls, some of which had to be demolished. The monastic complex remained in ruins for decades. Then in the 1970s, a project devised by the municipality of Genova gave the go ahead for the restoration of the area with the construction of new headquarters, such as the permanent urban observatory, created to promote initiatives for the rehabilitation of the historic center. Starting in the 1990s, another project, Progetto Civis Sistema, envisaged more con conservation and restoration work. However, this was interrupted in 1997 and the site was completely abandoned. Everything was enclosed with barbed wire and it was only in 2012 that a group of students decided to break the fences and clean up the area. Since then, Santa Maria in Passione lives almost exclusively thanks to the support of citizens through donations and voluntary work. So to conclude, by tracing a brief history of the construction, destruction and reconstruction through painstaking human efforts, 
I've tried to raise awareness of how essential the preservation of cultural heritage is for the wealth of communities. There is need for greater cooperation between different groups, from professionals in the field to the general public. As the example of Santa Maria in Passione demonstrates, ordinary citizens are often in a unique position to help when the threat of deterioration looms over them. The very significance of the Ministry of Works collection, which has never before seen in its entirety as a consequence of being spread across hundreds of boxes, is now being understood thanks to a major di digitization project at the Courtauld, part funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and supported entirely by volunteers. If ruins, as it has often been suggested, are essentially democratic, for their appeal is for everyone, from children visiting a site for the first time to experienced archaeologists, then their protection and revival becomes, by the same token, a universal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katarina. That was fascinating. We will get you back on in just a bit for the questions at the end. I am now thrilled to introduce everyone at home to two more wonderful members of the Court Hall community who will be in conversation with Tom for the next wee while. Carla Issa, who was born in North Iraq and has now set in the UK. Um, I will leave Carla to speak of her own experience, but to summarise, her hometown is an ancient Assyrian city which was controlled by ISIS until 2016. And I'm so thankful that she has agreed to talk about the value of the Kirstein photos in terms of memory, family, history, and to share her own story. These stories, landscapes, and people live on in the story that Carla is just about to tell us, so we're in for a treat. I'm also so happy to introduce you all to Phil Downs, who is one of our wonderful Court Hall volunteers, as well as being a photographer. Phil is going to share how and why he's walked and cycled in the footsteps of Kirstein, taking photographs to match Kirstein's own. Thank you all for being here. I'll pass over to you three just now to get started. Thank you, Leila. Right, well, thanks, Leila. Um, and a big welcome to Carla. Thank, Thank you, you for coming to the court hall. Um, we have some pictures to show you, but I should say that we've um, been working together for since 2019, having a look at the collection. And a very important moment was when you had a look and you found photographs of your hometown. Karakosh. Karakosh, yes. But we have some slides to show you, so we will go through that right now. Okay. So Carla, you've mentioned that you were born in Karakosh. At what stage of this was your life? How old were you when you, when you left? Um, I was uh, 17. Mm -hmm. So Karakosh is an Assyrian ancient city uh, in northern Iraq. And the photo here on the right, um, incredible. I was so amazed when I saw it here because I, as a child, I used to walk there. And this is um, 1940. Well, and what about the photograph on the left? Uh, from my church in Iraq, in Karakosh. Um, very old church there. Um, amazing. It's wonderful. And what was your thought on when you found these images here in a box in London? Uh, incredibly uh, important, historically important to see photos of my um, ancient city back to 1914 are uh, here in London. Um, I was amazed. It's like, wow. Um, I, I thought I'm going to come here for an hour. I spent four hours going through the photos and I don't want to leave. And in fact, that's my favorite secret place in London, I call it. Okay. And you brought your brother and your sisters. And my brother well. and my sister. Wonderful. Um, can I ask you about growing up in Karakosh before ISIS arrived? Um, what was it like? How, what was daily life like? Um, I would say Karakosh was the safest place in the world. What could happen? Um, to me, it was very safe, very simple life. Um, we had everything we wanted and everything we needed um, at the time. As you mentioned, Iraq was a very diverse country. So Jewish, Christian, Muslim and Yazidi people live happily together. Um, not anymore, sadly, uh, after 2014, everything changed. And can you, before we, we, we talk about your, your leaving Iraq, can you explain in more detail what happened that night? What happened to you and what happened to your family? The night that I never forget. Um, 
Um, actually, I received a phone call from my friend and saying that Mosul was controlled by ISIS. We were shocked. Um, thousands of questions was going to happen. We couldn't, we couldn't see the future. Um, so worried. Uh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to live? If, if my city was the safest, safest city in the world, so now where? Um, and to us was uh, Kurdistan. So we had to leave to Kurdistan, uh, to Erbil, and then from there to the Hug, and then to Baghdad to apply for new idea and passport, traveling to Lebanon, and then finally to UK. And can you describe what the, the, that night that you left, you said that you heard about the ISIS That's were true. arriving at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Um, we had- How much of your possessions could you take with you? We couldn't take anything. So at the time, um, you need just to, to be alive, I guess. Uh, you don't think about taking anything, um, even not your ID. So you just have to leave. Uh, and of course, I was worried about my sister, my family, uh, mom and my brother. So you just have to, to leave quickly um, as soon as possible. Because uh, if you don't leave now, you would not make it. Um, and that's the end of it. And I never thought that would be the last time I would see Karakosh. Um, and now it's been seven years. You thought you'd be gone for Well, we thought it was going to be, yeah, a few weeks, a few months, and then uh, back to home, school, everything back to normal, whatever that's mean, but never happened in my case. And did you did you leave by car? How did you how did you travel to Abiel? Um Well, we the church announced that um, you had to leave, um, so you don't have another choice, or you're not going to make it. So if you've got car, you have to leave by car. If no, you have to walk ten hours walking, twelve hours walking. So Kurdistan was a safe place just to run to at the time. And what happened to your to your father? Well, my father could not make it. Um, I've lost my father and uh, so many friends and. Yeah. He stayed behind. Yeah. So lots of people could not make it, um, sadly. You know, returning to these particular photographs, because obviously you're, you're now settled in the yeah. UK, you're at university. Yeah. Um, you've got a new career and a new life. Um, these particular photographs that Kirsting took, um, what significance do they have to you in discovering this collection? You know, what kind of memories do they evoke? Um, to me, it's incredibly important. Um, they are proof that these places are exist. So as you mentioned, Nebi Yunis and Lamazu, and most of these places, in fact, are destroyed now. So that is the only proof that they were exist. They were there. Um, um, I don't know, I'm just so amazed that I'm so grateful that they are here and people can see them and uh, just look at them and uh, back. And these, in fact, too, uh, this is, um, um, pictures from inside the church and um, on the right it's the old Aramaic so which is my tone language I speak Aramaic um, incredible that it's, it's here and do you think part of the attraction for you is that these pictures show a happier time yeah much happier wonderful well, Carla thank you very very much thank you thanks for having me and now um, we're just going to swap places. I've got Phil coming to sit with me and talk about his work here as a volunteer. I'll just move on. Um, the title of Phil's presentation is called Tangle um, for reasons that will become obvious. Uh, so Phil, how did you find out about this particular project? Uh, well, so I was, I'd finished my career in the printing and publishing industries and was doing what was called the long photographic course up at the City Lit, up just up the road. Uh, and the tutor there at the end of my course um, suggested I come down here because there was lots of fantastic photographs, as we know. And uh, very soon I was uh, digitizing the, the Kirsting photographs and going through his ledgers and looking at the photographs there. And um, I think we can have a first look at one of his fabulous photographs on the left. I should say that the, the, the work on the left is Kirsting's, the work on the right is, is Phil's own work. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the, the things I did, last things I did on my photographic course, uh, my last assignment was to follow around the living history people or, or reenactors as they're sometimes called. And that's where people act out things like um, Roman centurions or World War II kind of troops. And at that time, the Peter Jackson film had come out called um, They Shall Not Grow Old. 
and it's where he took World War I monochrome film and, and by AI methods, colorized the film. And that got me thinking, well, I'm following around these people pretending to be troops from the Second and First World War. Why don't I reverse that process? Why don't I decolorize them back to the black and white images we're all familiar with, but leave the modern world around them in color? So here's a picture of Windsor Castle from Kirsting. So I went to, this is really the first kind of experiment I did. I went to um, Windsor in approximately the same view that he has. Although one thing I have learned following Kirsten around is that he is the master of composition and I just trail very, very, very far behind him. But here on the right is my color picture, if you like, digital picture. And then the next slide, we'll see what I've done. I've selectively drained away the color. There were um, some tourists here and they were really having a good time. One of them was uh, waving a uh, uh, some colourful flag and his girlfriend was urging him on and they were having a, a really good time. So I thought, well, I'll keep them in, in colour because that's really something that's happening now. And I'll leave all that street furniture in there, the tangled mess that there is so much often now in, um, you know, tourist areas. And, and that, that was really the start of my experiments, if you like. We'll look at the next part. And I, I have a question for you. Do you think that your work is based on trying to recapture the nostalgia in Kirsting's work, or do you think your primary purpose is to document this thing that you've called the tangle of modern life? A bit of both. I, of my age, I am a. I was a kid growing up in the sixties, and many of Kirsting's uh, pictures uh, evoke in me that kind of sense of order and tidiness that I vaguely remember from being a young child. So there is a, that element to it, but also. Um, you know, if we take London, for instance, here we have St. Martin's in the field. Uh, this is only in recent weeks that I took this picture. And I've been going back and back to Trafalgar Square because there's so much always going on. And there's that picture from Kirsting that's nearly 60 years old of St. Martin's in the field. And here's my picture with a huge um, ice cream with a cherry on top that's been put on the false plinth. And so, again, I've drained away if you like a little nudge to just show the sort of uh, monochrome image that Kirsting took or, or an approximate viewpoint but I've left the uh, the bright red cherry to you know signify the modern world and what's happening now. Well we know that Kirsting was like a master at clearing people out of photographs and there's many abandoned and completely desolate town squares that he managed yes. to remove all the people in the cars. I was going to ask you do any of his photographs shock you? Well, it, not his photographs. Yeah, I mean, the, the change from him to here we have um, Bodicea and her sisters uh, on the top of Westminster Bridge. I think this picture from him is about 56 years old. This picture here on the right I took maybe a month ago. And I suppose the viewer could be forgiven for say, you know, saying how shocking it is, you know, all this paraphernalia of of tat and, um, <laughs> you know, tourist material underneath it. But maybe in another way you could say how vibrant and bright it is with all the all that's going on you know in London at the moment and let's face it only shortly after the pandemic as Absolutely. well let's move on to another pair okay so this is kind of uh, almost shocking uh, on the left is the bar gate in Southampton which is their uh, their, mo their uh, Norman built monument their, their old archway uh, gateway to the city uh, the picture I took was in uh, a couple of days before Christmas 2019. And what they had done, they'd used the uh, bar gate to erect um, a Santa sleigh ride zip wire <laughs> down into the shopping center. And I just sat there in marvel at it and sat in the coffee bar, as you can see the, the red awnings there. So I, I've kind of decolorized the bar gate just to keep in with cursing, but I've just left the rest there there in colour. I think this is probably my most surprising uh, view that I've I've pictured so far. Absolutely. And I find the question, I mean, Kirsten was a prolific traveller. How have you managed to keep up with him? Well, he 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 drove to places and then I think he must have done a lot of walking. In in many ways, I'm the same. I I, I walk a lot, I hang around on street corners, I just wait for things to happen. I cycle to sites. Um, so in, in many ways, I, I think I'm probably doing the same sort of traveling that he did. 
Um, but in terms of keeping up with him, I can't keep up with him technically. I can't keep up with him um, composition wise. He is, uh, you know, for me, a, a fabulous photographer. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Phil. And um, I think that finishes our presentation. So thank you, Katrina, Carla, Phil, and everyone else for inviting us to share a little bit about our collections. Yeah, thank you all so much. I think there's a lot to take away and mull over and, um, after everything that's just been discussed. I would now like to invite everyone to come back on screen. So Katrina, if you wanted to join us as well. We have a few questions in the chat and about eight minutes to see what we can get through. Um, so sorry in advance if I don't get to yours. So the first one is actually for Tom. And it's from Adrian and Adrian says, thank you, Tom, for the great talk. It's fantastic to hear that the materiality of the photographs is being respected and that they are not being cropped or retouched. Apart from COVID, what has been the greatest challenge while cataloguing and organizing the exhibition? Um, I think the greatest challenge has been working with the available material that you have, because obviously for an exhibition of this sort, we wanted to pay coverage to all the different communities in Iraq. So we have to have the photograph of the mosque, of the synagogue, of the church. And obviously, if you have unlimited choice, that's easy. And then you're trying to balance that against pictures that are actually very beautiful and make a strong visual impression. So it's in a sense, it's kind of apart from the other consideration of distilling a collection of several hundred pictures into just 20 that are going to appear on the walls. It's making sure that you're achieving a balance and that you're not, you're not in a sense, um, skewing the exhibition in any one way. Great, thank you. And another one for you, Tom. Laura's asking if you could say something in a way that Tony zips around the globe. Just a bit more about that quickly. Oh, goodness. Um, yes, I mean, Tony Kirsten was a prolific traveler and at a later point in his life, in the 1970s and the 1980s, he's often traveling to 12 or 14 countries in a month. Mm. And this is kind of crazy traveling. And as yet, we don't know enough to explain how this happened, because obviously he's not just traveling. He's booking hotel rooms. He might be finding a driver, a translator. All of these things um, are difficult to do, especially as in Tony's case, he was a single guy. He lived on his own for most of his life. Um, the sheer administrative burden of doing this is almost impossible. My theory, uh, is that he maintained a very, very close contact with the RAF. And so what probably happened is that somebody phoned him up and said, Tony, there's a seat going on a plane leaving for, I don't know, Barcelona tomorrow morning, do you want to come? And he'd just keep his bag and his camera by the front door and we would be off. It certainly explains the randomness of the traveling because a typical week in the life of Tony is that he'll be in Jamaica on the Monday, Tuesday, he'll be photographing the Boots factory in Nottingham on the Thursday, he'll be in the Cotswolds at the weekend, and then he'll be somewhere else. So um, it's pretty intense. And I think we've worked out his possible income compared to the amount that he might have spent on travel. And the gulf is unfathomable. So, Yeah, a total jet setter, definitely. Um, so we have a question for Carla from Acacia. And um, she's asking, what would you like to see done with these historic images in an ideal world? What would you like to see happen to them? Um, thank you. Well, I would like to show them to everyone, actually. So whoever is available to come to the gallery, very welcome, because it's nice to show everyone that these places exist and um, if they want to, to know more. Obviously, Tom is here and I'm here just to tell us to tell them more. Um, yeah, and to keep them safe. Great, thank you. And then a question for Carla, Katrina and Phil, um, this is actually for me. I wanted to ask what you are most excited about to see um, when these photographs are in the new gallery. Um, I would be happy to see everyone coming and see them. So yeah. I would be happy. I would like to see crowd with so many people and asking so many questions. Um, what does that mean? Or how do you feel? Or um, it would mean a lot to us, I think. As it's going to be one of the first exhibitions in the, you know, restored galleries, uh, I would hope it gets 
a lot of press coverage and that's, that's going to be very good to see as well. Definitely. And Katharina? And I would say various engagement, like different honest responses. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be amazing because it is, as you say, one of the first things that will be seen in the gallery. And um, people haven't been in for a long time and the appetite to get back in and actually see the objects in real life after such a long time is going to be enormous. And as I said at the start, this is the first day that people can book tickets. I don't know how many people have already booked, but from the 19th of November, everyone can do that. Um, just to read out a few of the comments in the chat. So Elizabeth said, thank you all so much for all present presentations and everyone's dedication to preserving the work, the history and the stories. So I think that's a really lovely thing um, to end on just now. So we actually don't have any more time this evening. This event has been recorded and it will be on the Portal YouTube channel very soon. Now, all I have time for is to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies again for their support and Tom, Katrina, Carla and Phil for being so open and honest and making this hour completely wonderful and to everyone at home for taking the time to join us wherever you are. I saw a few people put in the chat there in Bristol and other places up and down the UK, which is lovely to see after, because I know everyone can go back to real life events now, but the appetite for digital and being able to access things remotely is still there. So please do stay in touch and check out everything we have on at the portal, especially book your tickets so you can actually see these images in real life. Um, and as I said, Already the 19th of November is the first day. We will be doing a lot more activity around this exhibition when we open our doors. And we also want to encourage everyone to use the Conway Library and the images that it holds in any way they want. It is there for you. So please do get creative, do what you want. And Tom, I wondered if you wanted to say something quickly about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the wonderful gifts that the lottery have given us is the um, is a sense of the obligation that we have to publish these images online, free for anybody to use. I mean, there are restrictions on what you can do with them commercially, but in terms of enjoying them, printing them, using them for um, your own artwork, that's completely permitted, and it's something that we not only want to do. I mean, you certainly want to do don't want to do it grudgingly. We're not going to put some little print at the end saying, oh, you can also use this image. We want to really celebrate the fact that people can use this collection creatively, you know, whether that's for building jewelry or doing book bindings or wrapping the images around the car, all these things are possible. So I think the plan is to have some kind of design competition. I mean, we're really copying the Rikes Museum who do this absolutely brilliantly, but um, you know, we want to actually actively encourage people to use these pictures and to use them creatively. Definitely, yep. So that's the main takeaway of today, everyone at home. Do something, use the images, that's what they're there for. So our next Open Courthouse Hour will be looking at the restaging of some of our most loved works, the Courthouse, and the new curatorial story that we will have when we open. So I hope to see you all very soon. So thank you all again for joining us and thanks for everyone for speaking this evening. See you all later. Bye. Bye.